the same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, it's a real pleasure to introduce Mark Crispin Miller to UCSB Santa Barbara. Let me begin by expressing my gratitude for the very generous support extended by three or four groups rather, the Center for Film, Television and New Media, the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center, where the physical place where we are right now, um, and the Departments of English and Political Science. All those agencies um, recognize the importance of inviting this speaker to address this topic during the onset of this U.S. primary season. Mark Crispin Miller is professor of media ecology in the School of Education at NYU. He is author of a series of important books and articles, but rather than list them, I'd like to give you a more personal view of what makes uh, Professor Miller so distinct as an activist, an intellectual, and a scholar. I met Mark Crispin Miller 35 years ago uh, in graduate school at Johns Hopkins. Since then, he has made major contributions in film and media studies, the history of advertising and propaganda, the patterns of media ownership, and most recently, a cogent critique of and analysis of the means by which the right wing of the Republican Party has asserted its political hegemony. His first book, Boxed In, The Culture of TV, is still an invaluable resource for a media scholar trying to understand the two most characteristic but apparently contradictory impulses of television. On the one hand, the feel-good affirmation and hype associated with advertising and entertainment. And on the other, the glib but pervasive irony that mocks most of the civic values that, um, uh, that circulate in our society, mocks them as quaintly passe or trivially partisan. That book ends with a landmark reading of Orwell's 1984, which neatly condenses Miller's habitual critical stance that we need to understand our own implication in the forces that threaten to oppress us. He encoded that idea in the title of that chapter on 1984, Big Brother Is You Watching. More, more recently, Professor Miller has turned his critical skills to the rise of the right, diagnosing at every turn a fraught relationship between language and truth. Uh, his first book is entitled um, On the Bush uh, Administration is the Bush Dyslexicon, Observations on a National Disorder. The second book, which came out after 9-11, uh, Cruel and Unusual, Bush Cheney's New World Order. And his most recent book, Fooled Again, How the Right Stole the 2004 Election and Why They Will Steal the Next One Too Unless We Stop Them. Professor Miller tells me that Fooled Again has received no reviews in the mainstream press and a profound skepticism of its central thesis is as strong on the left as the right. Before turning the podium over to Mark, I'd like to suggest a reason why we all resist, or most of us do, the thought that our elections have been fraudulently manipulated. As we enter the election season, th those of us who love politics or are addicted to it want to throw ourselves into the election process with the same 
um, forgetful glee that a football fan enters the playoff season and the march to the Super Bowl. Anyone who tenders evidence of election fraud may be greeted as a spoil sport, one who robs for ev everyone uh, of the unconscious pleasure of the game. But is there any more important issue before this nation than the integrity of our elections? If this is a republic where it is the people who are sovereign and all legitimate authority depends, therefore, on the franchise, um, if that is so, that complex process by which citizens elect representatives to speak and act for them is the condition of the possibility of having a, a republic. If that process is corrupted, representation fails, sovereignty will not be legitimate, and political unity is at risk. And I think we can see in recent events in Mexico, political events in Mexico, Kenya, and now Pakistan, the effects of that failure of legitimacy. If that election fraud happens and it is ignored, democracy becomes an illusion. So thank you for gathering here today to hear, and then I hope you will stay later to discuss with Professor Miller this difficult but important issue. The title of Professor Miller's talk is Loser Take All, Election Fraud and the Subversion of Democracy 2000-2008. Thank you. Please join me in welcoming Mark Miller. I'm really interesting. I have no idea. Thank you for that a wonderful introduction. Uh, Bill is a dear old friend of mine, and I want to thank Ron Rice and Connie Pendley for making this possible, my friend Matthew Stewart for putting me up, and all of you for coming, uh, because uh, my talks are not often well attended <laughs> for reasons that I'm going to talk about. And I'm especially uh, pleased, I mean on this subject, especially pleased to see uh, young people here. Uh, because until today, the median age of the audience at my talks on this subject has been about 55. Um, this uh, probably will seem to you to be a, a civic matter that I'm going to discuss, and indeed it is. It's a profoundly important civic matter. I make that point at the beginning to distinguish uh, this issue from uh, the sort of merely technical concern, uh, which, which is the way it's often represented in, in the media, if it's represented at, at, at all, that it's a problem of electronic voting machines, uh, we get the wrong kind of technology, there's a right kind of technology we should be looking at, uh, and the issue is, is dispatched in that, in that way. Some of you may have seen the, the cover story in the New York Times Magazine uh, very recently about electronic voting, and it, and it made that argument. That there's a bad kind of technology, paperless voting machines. There's a good kind of technology, optical scanners, and we should be moving in that way, in that direction. And your Secretary of State, uh, Deborah Bowen, uh, basically takes that view, that you got to get rid of the paperless machines, which of course is a good idea, but in their place we need optical scanners. That's a bad idea. However, I don't want to talk at first about this as a civic or as a technical issue. I want to talk about it as, a, as an epistemological and psychological issue for the reasons that Bill just mentioned. But what has what what most staggered me as I've been you know, engaged in working on this subject is the extent to which the truth about the situation appears to be uh, subjective arguable, and I'm going to give you an example of what I'm talking about. This is a passage from a recent profile of Barack Obama that was published in the New York Times on December 28th. A member of a new generation, Obama, Obama walks a fine line. And this, this is the passage. In Washington, Mr. Obama made it clear almost immediately that his career would not be defined by his race. One of the first acts of the new Congress was to certify the results of the Electoral College. This is after the 2004 election. Some members of the Congressional Black Caucus moved to contest the certification of the Ohio votes. Mr. Obama did not join them. In a hastily arranged maiden speech, 
He said he was convinced that President Bush had won, but he also urged Congress to address the need for voting reform. Okay, so the last part of it uh, is in keeping with the theme of the piece, which is that Obama's a triangulator. He tries to have it both ways. You know, he refused to back the Congressional Black Caucus, refused to do so by saying, no, Bush really won, but he said, nevertheless, I'm for voting reform. Okay, that's all fine. And that, that sort of fits the general way in which the press talks about politics. It's all personalities, it's all celebrity, it's all personal style, and so on. But there's something really strange about this passage, and that is its first sentence. Mr. Obama made it clear almost immediately that his career would not be defined by his race, which means that the question of the election in Ohio can be answered in racial terms, one way or the other. That is, if you are black, Bush stole it. If you're white, he won. See? So there's two truths, and, and whichever one you pick has to do with the lens, the racial lens through which you see things. So it's like, you know, OJ. If you're black, he was innocent. If you're white, he was guilty. But this is, you know, leaving aside the question of OJ's guilt, the election in Ohio was almost certainly stolen, regardless of what color you are. See? And we should discuss it that way, which is to say, scientifically. Now, as Bill said, the press uh, and both the left and right have been sort of officially skeptical about this argument. I'm going to give you a second example of how the truth is treated as up for grabs. Uh, oddly, and, and I, I go into this in the new afterward to Fooled Again, which is now out in paperback, with a, a hundred new pages about 2006, and also about how the press has treated the issue. Oddly, the most damage has been done to the issue of election fraud by the left press, because whereas the Mainstream media has tended to ignore the issue. They just don't mention it, talk about it, they don't see it. Uh, the left press has actually made it its unofficial business to debunk the claims fraud. So The Nation, uh, Mother Jones, TomPaine.com, they've all done these pieces uh, echoing one another, saying there's no evidence of fraud in Ohio, and, and, the, and I go through the pieces meticulously in the afterward because they're just, objectively speaking, as journalism, extremely shoddy work. They basically involve the reporter saying, I talked to a Democrat, and he said nothing like that happened. That's the evidence. Well, the most aggressive in his debunking was Farad Manju of Salon. And Salon was really, uh, you know, hostile to any suggestion that the election was stolen. And Manju launched a particularly vitriolic attack on uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who, as some of you may know, did a big, I think a landmark piece uh, on Ohio, it came out in Rolling Stone in the summer of 2006, surveyed all the evidence, did new research, and found uh, that Kerry won Ohio or would have won Ohio, and this is a conservative estimate, by 350,000 votes. You know, the official story is that Bush won by 118,000. Well, anyway, what was striking, uh, many things were striking about Manju's piece, but, but I think what was most striking was that it, at one point, he referred to me and to Kennedy as representing the far left. The far left. So we're like a, a members of the Shining Path movement. <laughs> You know what I mean? I mean, we want to nationalize women. You know, we're on the far left. You know, I don't, that, there again, it's not race there, it's ideology. So if you're way, way over on the left, you think the election was stolen. Final example. There's the racial lens, there's the ideological lens, and then of course there's the partisan lens. Uh, there was an interview on the Don Imus show, he's back, you know, went away, but now he's back, 
with um, Michael Beschloss, you know, the historian who, who was always on TV and so on. And uh, Imus asked him about the possibility that the election was stolen, and he, he asked in a, in a mood, you know, with some hilarity, like, you know, <laughs> you know, what do you think? And Beschloss laughingly compared those who were making this argument, he called them diehard Kerry supporters, and said that they were, they were like those Japanese soldiers who stumbled out of the jungle, you know, in Okinawa uh, 20 or 30 years after the war. Okay, now leaving aside the fact that that actually may never have happened, I don't mean to be like pedantic with a historian or anything, there's no, there's no connection between the election reform movement and the Kerry campaign because the Kerry campaign and Kerry himself have done everything possible not to talk about this issue. It has nothing to do with support for Kerry. It has nothing to do with the Democratic Party, which has been passively colluding in this disastrous process by refusing to deal with it. And I will tell you about my own experience with John Kerry, which is extremely dramatic and, and very, very relevant to this, to this occasion. When Fool Again came out in the fall of 2005, I wanted to get it into the hands of um, everyone with any influence, because it seemed to me, you know, and here I was being naive, I'd written a book in, in clear English addressing an issue of profound importance to the survival of Republican democracy, and it was and is copiously documented. You know, pages and pages and pages of very precise end notes. And Bill and I went to Johns Hopkins together. We were in graduate school together. <laughs> we learned, if we hadn't learned already, the crucial importance of documenting your claims, you see? So I thought, in my naivete, here I'm making an argument that is sure to kickstart a crucial debate on an issue that really concerns all of us. Someone who shared my concern and who was close to Kerry got me invited to a fundraiser for him in Chelsea, in New York, where I live. And so on October 28th, 2005, I met with him and uh, had the book in my hot little hands. And I went up to him and said, you were robbed, Senator. And he said, I know, just like that fingertips and everything. I know. And he immediately started to complain, I mean, with vehemence about his fellow Democrats in Washington. They won't listen. They won't discuss it. He said, I was just talking to Chris Dodd last week. I said, Chris, these machines, there's something really suspicious about them. We've got to do something about it. Do you know what he said to me? He said, we looked into it. There's nothing to it. Kerry looks at me and says, they're in denial, okay? Now, I was, I was flabbergasted, I mean, in a good way, <laughs> because I expected him, you know, I had talked to him once before at a, another fundraiser at George Plimpton's house. I mean, I, I'm, I'm really, really uh, familiar with a lot of famous people, okay? <laughs> Their doors are all open to me. When he was just a contender for the Democratic nomination, I, I met with him and I tried to meet with other Democrats to say, you know, these voting machines are really uh, worrisome and if you want to win, you better do something about them. And at the time, this is in 2003, he, 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 he clearly, visibly thought that I was insane. You know, I could see it in his eyes, like, oh, Jesus, somebody rescue me. So I expected a similar sort of treatment. He says, yes, yes, yes. No, no. He was passionate about this, passionate about this. And I was therefore elated because my view was and remains that his concession was a catastrophe as big as the theft of the election in the first place. And that was my view. And it was John Edwards's view too, by the way. Uh, but no, he had a completely different reaction. There was no sense in which this was off the record. Okay, one thing he said might have led a person to infer was off the record because we were talking once I saw how 
concerned he was about this, I, I, you know, I said, you've got, you've got to be the one to make an issue out of this. You know, you have the moral standing to do it. And he said, well, somebody should do it. You're absolutely right. I don't know if it can be me because of the sour grapes factor. Okay? And I said, sincerely, I understand that. I understand that you would be worried about that, but believe me, if you look at the evidence, you will be able to say, you know, you didn't want to believe it, you didn't believe it, but now you've studied it and you must conclude with infinite regret, you know, I'm writing him a speech, right? That it's true, and it's not just about you, and it's not just about the Democratic Party, it's about the f future of democracy. He said, you're right, you know, this, this is, I'm really, you know, going to read your book, and he socked me on the arm. I mean, they really do that. <laughs> and, and he gave me a thumbs up, you know. I mean, I really, I felt blessed, you know what I mean? I, I, I actually even got a little hot, you know what I mean? It was, wow, Good, you know, big, tall guy. And I, I thought, oh, geez, this is amazing. So that was a Friday. My book tour started on Tuesday, and I was in New York, and I told the story everywhere I went. And then on the next Friday, I was on Democracy Now!, uh, debating Mark Hertzgard, another old friend of mine, but a guy who wrote a piece in Mother Jones saying, no evidence of fraud. I know because I talked to a Democrat, and he told me there wasn't any. So in the course of this argument with Mark, you know, he actually said something like, well, you know, if this was true, Kerry would be on the case. I said, well, as it just so happens, I spoke to him last week, and he told me he thinks the election was stolen. And Mark was really you know, impressed by this. Wow, you buried the lead today and all this. So the producers of the show sent out a press release saying, Kerry told me he thinks the race was stolen. And you can Google my name, and it's like the fourth thing down. This press release still out there in cyberspace forever. And then, as you would expect, the internet exploded with people saying either that schmuck, why didn't he say this in the first place? Or, no, 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 you know, better late than never. Thank God, you know, which was my position. So the three hours this went on, and then Kerry's office released a statement categorically denying we'd had the conversation. Didn't happen. We know Professor Miller's trying to sell a, a book. You know, so like it was like it was the equivalent of my jumping out of a cake, you know, in Times Square. It was just a publicity stunt. So you know, I was um, I was angry, of course. And when people wrote to me saying, "Yeah, that cowardly, you know, see, he's afraid and so on. He doesn't want to be called a conspiracy theorist," and then two days later. A uh, great reporter named uh, Robert Perry, whom some of you may know, has a website called consortiumnews.com that I recommend, uh, ran a piece quoting, on the record, a longtime associate of Kerry's named Jonathan uh, Weiner, W-I-N-E-R, who said, Kerry does think it was stolen, but he won't talk about it because he knows that if he does, the powers in place will smash him. Okay. So there's the argument that he, 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 he pulled into his shell because he knows that it's, it's too hot a subject and everybody will dump on him if he talks about it. Well, I thought about that and I realized that that, that doesn't make any sense. See? Because if Kerry really believed and accepted here that the election was stolen, I don't mean just understand it cerebrally, because he's not stupid. And, you know, with all due respect to people who keep insisting it wasn't stolen, you know, just a couple hours of studying the evidence makes pretty clear that it was. And indeed, there is no evidence that Bush won. Okay? If Kerry didn't just understand it from here up, but took it to heart, what would he care what names people call him. See? What, what would he care if people call him names? This is an emergency. If, if this building were on fire, and I could smell the smoke, and I knew we were all going to die, and you were all high on coke, and in a foolish mood, or ecstasy, whatever drug you take, I don't know, 
And I figured, if I tell you the building's burning, you're going to giggle at me and call me an alarmist. Or would I say, ah, to hell with it. I don't want people to call me names. So I'll just burn to death. I think that's a perfectly strong analogy. No, Kerry can't go there, okay? Now, I'm not denying that there are some Democrats who are in collusion. In places like rural Ohio and in Florida, a lot of Democrats are basically Republicans. Where politics is racial, you know, they kind of work together. So that goes on, there's no question about it. And no question about it, there are Democrats who are in the pockets of the voting machine companies. This is all true. But when it comes to a lot of other leading Democrats, I really think that what we're talking about here is denial for complicated reasons. First of all, none of us wants to think, as Bill suggested at the beginning, that the game is fixed because this strikes at the very foundation of our cherished national self-image. That doesn't happen here. This is not Kenya. This is not Pakistan. This is America. Our elections aren't stolen. The system works. We go around the world promoting democracy at gunpoint. We do that. And anytime we read an article in the Times or whatever about the unseemly eruptions in places like Islamabad or Nairobi, you know, inv invariably the tone is condescending. Oh, it's a young democracy, you know, so we expect this sort of thing. All of this, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of ragging on the press here, but we all sort of share this assumption, but this is America. Stuff doesn't happen here. And then there's, a, there's the more complicated fact that Kerry is an insider. Kerry has a lot to lose. He's part of the power structure. Same with Al Gore. You know, I mean, they have a lot of money. They're involved with both parties. They're, they're entrenched. They're solidly inside. What are they supposed to do? If you accept the premise that the election's been stolen, okay, then you, you have to do something radical about it. You have, to, you have to sort of hit the mattresses or go on the barricades or whatever, you know, whatever metaphor you want to use. You can't just go back to hailing your good friend across the aisle, you know, the honorable gentleman from Mississippi, because this is not the kind of convenient, comfortable arrangement you thought it was where the parties divide up their turf and they help each other out. That stuff's gone on, it's always gone on. But this is different because there's, there's an element within the Republican Party that doesn't want the status quo, that wants to destroy the Democratic Party by turning it into a permanent minority party of color. That's what they want to do. They want to transcend the need for something as unpredictable and messy as elections. Now, there are various ways in which we have all participated in the denial of what really went down. Okay, one way is to say, well, it happened in Ohio. You know, it was a squeaker in Ohio. Okay, first of all, there's copious evidence that it wasn't really a squeaker at all. That, you know, some people in this community have made the argument that Kerry won or would have won by at least five million votes. Because what happened involved an enormous menu of dirty tricks and tactics that disfranchised thousands and thousands of would-be Democratic voters every step of the way, from registration through recounts. See? And the press has been almost completely silent on every phase of this. So it wasn't really a squeaker, and it didn't only happen in Ohio, but the media spotlight shone on Ohio, so we think, Oh, that's where it all went down. But every single thing that happened in Ohio happened all over the country. People trying to vote for Kerry on the machines and the machine flipping the vote to Bush. This happened in Michigan, it happened in Wisconsin, it happened in New Jersey, it happened all over the South, it happened everywhere. A shortage of voting machines in Democratic precincts only so that there were very long lines and people couldn't vote because they had to go to work or pick up their kids People showing up, having registered, and being told, hey, you're not registered. In some parts of Ohio, between 10 and 20 percent of the Democrats had this experience because the databases are computerized too. 
And when you have a computerized system, it takes under a minute to make major changes. And I could go on and on. All kinds of stuff like this went down, a broad range of tactics, and it didn't only happen in Ohio, it happened nationwide, okay? Now another way, and this I return to my opening, in which we deny the severity of this crisis is to say, well, it's a, it's a technical problem. And people of goodwill can agree on reforms, okay, that will bring us the right kind of technology and the right kind of technicians. People we can trust to manage the machinery for us. Okay, now first of all, this is, this represents a complete misunderstanding of the nature of the democratic system. You don't trust anyone to handle a vote count for you, and you don't tolerate a secret vote count, which is what the use of any kind of computerized system entails. It is a secret vote count. Whether it's paperless or optical scanners, you cannot watch the vote being counted. And I don't care if it's your dearest friend in the world, I don't care if, you're, if it's your own spouse, whoever it is, you don't trust them to handle it properly for you. So there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a failure to appreciate how risky computerized systems are, but it is not a technical issue, it is a civic issue. Because what we're basically talking about here is the fact that we as a nation have become radically estranged from our first principles, okay, which is about Republican self-government, it's about checks and balances, it's about uh, not allowing the vote to be captured by private interests. Because basically what has happened is that the voting system in this country has been privatized. Now how did this happen? Let me tell you, this is a very interesting story. After the 2000 election, which was demonstrably stolen by the Republicans in various ways, through the Supreme Court's interference in the vote count, the Supreme Court stopped the vote count. Through mob action that shut down the vote count in Miami-Dade County, we, people tend to forget that. Remember that bourgeois riot? When they b broke into the uh, canvassing board's room in Miami-Dade and beat people up and warned that a thousand Cubans were coming to beat up more people. Do you remember this? Uh, and the butterfly ballot, which was deliberately designed to confuse people by Teresa Lepore, the supervisor of the Palm Beach County, Board of Elections, who everybody said was a Democrat, do you remember this? And who ran as a Democrat, but who was a long time Bush operative, a Republican who became a Democrat to be elected to that position. I mean, I can go on. You know that the uh, felons list was used to disfranchise tens of thousands of Floridians. The company that did the list of felons told Bush's people this list is extremely unreliable, and Bush's people said, that's okay. As long as there's a rough similarity between the names, that's fine. So a lot of people were, were felons. I mean, the race was stolen, it was stolen in Florida. What did the Democrats do? The Democrats said, we need election reform. Did I capture the pathetic? <laughs> we need election reform. Not, not, you know, hey, you know, this, no, they all told Gore, throw in the towel, and Gore threw it in, because he didn't want to be divisive, right? Instead of saying, you stole an election, you know, you, you, you went against the will of the electorate. No, said, we need election reform. So the Bush White House and the Republicans in the Senate said, yeah, you're right, we do. And if we got a reform for you, <laughs> I'm not making this up. The election reform that they proposed was the Help America Vote Act 2002, which was, you know who wrote it? Representative Bob Ney, who's now in prison, right, and who's deeply implicated with Jack Abramoff, whose money laundering operation was set up to finance election fraud schemes. I'm connecting a few dots, okay, but it's true. That's what it was all about. And who supported the Help America Vote Act of 2002? Everybody. The Democrats supported it. This is a reform. Common cause supported it. People for the American way supported it. 
It's called a reform. We're all for it. See? The fact that it involved basically allowing private corporations to take over the voting process didn't seem to bother them at all. So we are now where we are. As we've seen in New Hampshire, it is still entirely possible and indeed quite easy to fiddle with voting results. And again, the press has bent over backwards to explain all this away by concocting demographic facts as they go. Oh yeah, these were racists who didn't want to tell the pollsters they were voting for a black man. Oh, okay, how do you know that? Well, bleh. yeah, that's what happened. But how do you know? Well, the fact is Obama took the north half of the state, which is all rural, and he lost the southern half of the state, which is college towns and cities. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, in that case, it was a late surge for Hillary among, you know, th these are explanations that they come up with because it, sa first of all, saves them the trouble of looking into it, right? And second of all, it gets them away from the awful truth. So in Florida, yeah, it was Nader. Nader. Spoiler, Nader. Okay, 2004, oh, the religious right. Oh, yeah. Religi yeah, sure. Even though they weren't anywhere near enough of those people to make the difference, even though no polls even begin to substantiate that claim, these are, and then Hillary cried. Remember this? Hillary cried, and Obama died. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just like that, magic tears, amazing. Well, the fact is that Obama won the hand-counted precincts by some six points, and Hillary won the machine-counted precincts by some six points. This is a system that we know for a fact can be hacked this is a system in which all over New Hampshire, just before the election, people from the one private company that does all the programming of the machines in that state paid visits to the machines and made changes in the memory cards. Okay? The Dory Smith, a radio reporter in Connecticut, found this out just by calling the town clerks. Okay? I'm not saying that it was stolen. I'm just saying you can't tell me that it wasn't. So, have I gone far enough in, in bumming everybody out? Or should I go on? Because I know that this part of the talk is very scary, and you're thinking, oh, Jesus, when can I get home to my bathtub and open my veins? <laughs> which, is, which is not the response. If it's not appropriate. Depression is just anger turned inward, right? As Dr. Well, Dr. Phil wouldn't tell you that, but maybe Joyce Brothers would. I don't know. And at any rate, this is a, this is a you would? OK. Freud, well, of course, Freud. Not everybody's heard of Freud. <laughs> um, this is a situation that we got into through certain policies and longstanding traditions, and it's a situation we can reverse. I'm well aware that this, I mean, and I haven't even scratched the surface, okay? I mean, Fooled Again is packed with data. Uh, I also have another book coming out in a few months that I edited that it has the title of this talk. It's called Loser Take All, Election Fraud and the Subversion of Democracy, 2000 to 2008. This is a collection of essays by other people on different examples of fraud in our elections from 2000 on up through the present. So if you want still more evidence of fraud, because a lot of stuff has come out since 2004. By all means, get that book. But enough of this, okay? Enough of this. This isn't any fun. I've proposed a 12-step program <laughs> to save American democracy. And people ask, you know, what do we do? How can, you know, is there some alternative? I think these steps would really help us out. Now, no system is fraud proof, you understand. The election in Mexico was indeed stolen, at least all the evidence suggests it was stolen from Obrador, and they have a system of hand counted paper ballots. And of course, there was election fraud before the rise of these machines. So, again, the fact, the crucial fact is not that we got to find the right mousetrap, the crucial fact is that we have to cherish and protect our rights as the citizens of a republic, okay? However, I do believe that this program will help us tremendously to escape fraud at its most dangerous.
And I call it a 12-step program, not only because 12 is a nice number, but because we are, in fact, as Bill suggested at the beginning, addicted to the horse race. We're addicted to the horse race. We're gambling addicts. And the horse race is fixed. And we're all going dangerously broke because of this addiction. So I, I, I think we all should get straight. And this is a way to get straight. I'm going to take you through these 12 steps quickly, OK? First of all, we have to repeal the Help America Vote Act, because that act is the legislation that mandated, in an indirect way, the use of electronic voting machines. The last state in the union to refrain from picking one of these systems is New York State, and New York has been sued by the Department of Justice for this reason. Okay? And I think they're settling, and I think we're going to have electronic machines there, too. We gotta, you know, also, the Help America Vote Act establishes Bush's Election Assistance Commission, which is a presidentially appointed body of people whose power over our elections is growing exponentially. Now, I'm a believer in checks and balances. I think the states should run elections. Federal government shouldn't run them, and this federal government shouldn't run anything, okay? <laughs> I mean, talk about, uh, thank you, unnecessary and useless. Okay. <laughs> now, let's replace all electronic voting machines with hand-counted paper ballots. I promise you this is what's going to happen eventually, assuming we keep having elections. If it's all optical scanners, you know, there's already been copious evidence. I mean, many cases of optical scanners being involved in highly dubious elections, and they break down all the time. Their record is terrible. You know, optical scanners, just to make clear, differ from paperless machines in that they do count paper. So at least there are ballots to count. You know, it's like your GRE tests, you know, it reads them. But they can be hacked with great ease. It's the easiest thing in the world to hack them. There's a study at the University of Connecticut which found that they can be wired so you can actually mess with them from, from outside the system. Moreover, they're manufactured by the same companies that make the paperless machines. And you know that those companies, I'm assuming probably you don't know, how would you, all have long, close relations with the Republican Party. Okay, Diebold is the most notorious. It's changed its name now to Premier, okay? The CEO of Diebold, Wally O'Dell, promised in a fundraising letter to Ohio Republicans in 2004 that he would do everything in his power to deliver Ohio to Bush. Okay, it doesn't prove that he did, but the fact is that Diebold is, is joined at the hip with the Republican Party. The second biggest one is called ES and S. Do you know who the CEO of ES and S was for four years before his political career began? Is it? Thank you, Chuck Hagel. Did you hear what I said? Chuck Hagel, senator from Nebraska, was CEO of a voting machine company for four years. He then quit to run for the Senate from Nebraska, where they counted the votes with the SNS machines. And you know that he won election and re-election by surprisingly high margins? Isn't that amazing? Heart InterCivic is another one of the big four. One of the biggest shareholders in Hard Inter Civic is Tom Hicks, who's a friend of Bush's. Now, if these were all Democrats, I'd still be standing here complaining because it's completely inappropriate. So let's just do away with the machines. Optical scanners, paperless machines, junk them, you know? Let's get rid of them and go to hand-counted paper ballots the way we used to do. They were counted out in the open. So it'll take a little longer, although in fact, with electronic machines, they break down so often that that can take forever, too. Also, let's get rid of computerized voter rolls, which is to say electronic databases. That's how you're registered now. There was a piece in USA Today last month saying there have been thousands of documented cases of disenfranchisement, of people knocked off electronic databases. So let's get rid of those too while we're at it. Let's also, you know, in, in whatever way a service might be provided Let's make sure that private vendors have nothing to do with any of it, because they don't belong in the election process. Get rid of them. A ban on private vendors, OK? Now, here's a tough one. And there'll be a lot of belly aching about freedom of speech. 
but let's make it illegal for the networks to declare a winner before all the uh, votes have been counted. What do you think of that idea? You like it? I mean, this used to be an issue because they would declare a winner before people finished voting out here, right? That was an issue. This is much bigger because now, you know, you'll have 60, 100,000 votes uncounted and they'll say, oh, so-and-so won. No, that's wrong. It's like shouting fire in a crowded theater. That shouldn't be permitted so they don't get to have a scoop. You know, cry me a river. Because when they declare the victor, you understand the psychological door closes and every attempt thereafter to audit or to recount seems like sour grapes. So let's just stop this foolishness now. This is too serious to allow them to get away with it. Now, our exit polling system. It's private also, okay? You know that the media industry, the media outlets, hire the exit polling company. Do you know what the function of exit polls is in our country? You know what the function of exit polls was in Ukraine, for example? The function was to keep the vote count honest, right? You have exit polls to make sure that the official vote count is, is accurate. Is, that makes sense, does it not? That's not what exit polls are for in this country. Exit polls have no corrective function in the United States. The function of exit polls in this system is to give data to the media so they can make their early calls. That's its function. So I say, it's uh, ended. Let's have a publicly supported exit poll system managed by professional pollsters who aren't you know, helping anybody out financially. Now, voter registration, okay? For, for forever, voter registration rules have been used to disenfranchise somebody. So let's just say that when you're 18, you're registered. What do you think of that? How, how, how does the notion of universal suffrage strike you? I, I, I'm all for it. I think it sounds really good. Universal suffrage. Would you all say that with me? Universal suffrage. And I think we should ask all the Democrats and the Republicans running for office, do you support universal suffrage or not? Just say yes or no, okay? Do you? I think it's an important thing. And I think if we junk the registration rules, we'll just, a lot, of, a lot of problems will be solved. Now we have to have a ban on state requirements for documents, photo IDs. You know that the Supreme Court is gonna uphold the Indiana law. Let me make sure everybody understands. There's a law that was passed in Indiana by the Indiana legislature motivated by the argument that there's all this voter fraud, that is people voting 10 times, you know, like used to happen in Mayor Daley's Chicago, right? Which means Democrats committing sort of retail fraud individually. So in order to guard against that, we need stringent requirements at the polls. We need Jim Crow legislation so that people who want to vote have to schlep all kinds of documents and things and pass a lot of tests and pay for the, the ID and so on. There is not a single known instance of voter fraud in the state of Indiana. This is a myth. In fact, voter fraud is so minimal as to be insignificant. This is statistically true. Let me add, the, the Election Assistance Commission uh, asked for a study by two statisticians of the state of you know, voter fraud in the United States today, and they were taken aback by the discovery that there really isn't any to speak of. I mean, it's impossible to do it in a system like ours with machines and so on. It doesn't happen. So what did the EAC do with that report? They refused to release it, and then they rewrote it. I mean, you can find it online. One of the co-authors is named Tova Wang, W-A-N-G. You can find the original version, which argues with evidence that it's not a problem. So we gotta get rid of these Jim Crow laws, which now that the court seems inclined to uphold this one, will probably spread to other states, see? Let me point out, okay, I said before this is a civic issue. The problem isn't technical, it's civic. Which means that if the machines fall into sufficiently bad odor, see, so that people want to get rid of them, I, I think that the, the movement I'm talking about here, that is the movement to disenfranchise the electorate, will, will 
increasingly adopt preemptive tactics. Rather than setting up machines that shred your vote or don't count it or change it or whatever, better to prevent people from being able to vote in the first place. See, that's the model, and we can't allow that to happen. So we have to ban this kind of legislation. Now, voter fraud could happen, could happen. Therefore, I think the simplest thing to do, you know, rather than requiring poor old people to come up with documents they can't afford, let's put all the polls under video surveillance because we're under surveillance everywhere else as it is, right? If the polls are under surveillance, you can catch people committing fraud trying to vote twice. You can catch improprieties and errors by election personnel, and you'll have a visual record of the traffic at every polling place. After the 2004 election in Ohio, people were saying, yeah, oh yeah, uh, six o'clock at the Republican polling place, thousands of Christians suddenly showed up. Uh, nay, nay, they multiplied like Jesus' loaves and fishes. As far as the eye could see, it was all Christians voting for Bush. There they were. Well, uh, fine, you say so. Let's look at the tape, shall we? Let's see if anybody came in, you know? Because some of the activists I know who were there said the place was like empty. So let's just put surveillance, fine with me. Have election day declared a federal holiday. so Everybody can vote, it's an old idea. Make it illegal for secretaries of state to co-chair political campaigns. Did you know that Ken Blackwell in Ohio was co-chair of Bush Cheney in Ohio? You know that Catherine Harris in Florida was co-chair of Bush Cheney in Florida? You know that Jan Brewer, Secretary of State in Arizona, was co-chair of Bush Cheney in Arizona? How, how, why is this allowed? You know, shouldn't be, it should be illegal. Now finally, just so nobody thinks I'm a bleeding heart liberal, which I'm actually not, uh, I think that uh, election fraud should be very seriously punished. I think there should be a three strikes and you're out rule, you know, election fraud. I think it should carry a, a prison sentence of life. And, and I, I don't believe in disenfranchising felons, but I think we make an exception here. Disenfranchisement is actually a pretty good idea. Because we, look, either we believe in, 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 in our Republican democracy or we don't. It's really ultimately as simple as that. Either we treat this as a kind of sport, a biennial sporting event where people like Chris Matthews can, can bloviate and shout ideas that he's just made up and talk about why Gore lost or why Kerry lost. You know, talk about this Hillary's style or Obama, how did he do and all this, all this sort of theatrical criticism. Or we can take this seriously and understand that, it, you know, if we don't have the right and the power to vote our representatives in and out of office, we have no power at all. And we are vassals. Okay? We're, va we're vassals. We might be well-dressed vassals. We might have a good salary. But we're still vassals nevertheless. Now what has happened is this. The tactics that were used originally and primarily to keep black people from voting, to deprive them of political power, were very crude. You know, Theodore Bilbo, notorious segregationist senator said, the best way to keep niggers from voting is to visit them the night before. Okay? Well, what's changed there is that the, the tactics have become far more, uh, there's been a lot more finesse used than that. That's awfully crude. And it isn't just black people. It isn't just black people and Hispanics. It isn't just black people, Hispanics, and Native, Amer Native Americans. It isn't just black people, Hispanics, Native Americans, and students, as it has been in the last few elections. It's ultimately the majority. Bush went into the 2004 election with significant losses of support especially in rural America, and to a slightly less ex lesser extent in small town and suburban America. This is all 
statistically demonstrable. He lost a lot of Republican support because a fringe movement has long since taken over the Republican Party. 60 newspapers that had backed Bush in 2000 in so-called red states refused to back him in 2004. All kinds of prominent Republicans, you know, uh, like John Eisenhower and General Tony McPeak and Lee Iacocca, and uh, who's the guy in Georgia who was one of Clinton's main adversaries? Uh, what's his name? The guy in the House of Representatives. Who? Bob Barr, right. They all came out and they said, don't vote for Bush. Bush is not a conservative. This was significant. 169 tenured and emeritus business professors signed a full page ad in the New York Times and the Financial Times saying that Bush's economic policies were not conservative, were extremely dangerous, and that people shouldn't vote for him for re-election. And you know where the ad originated? The Harvard Business School. This is where Bush got his degree. Okay? All of this, you know, coheres into a picture of a guy who couldn't possibly have won re-election even narrowly. This is a guy whose disapproval ratings going into the 2004 election were in the mid to high 40s. Higher than LBJ's in 1968, higher than Jimmy Carter's in 1980, yet he swept to victory late in the day. It's a miracle, isn't it? Well, it, 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 it didn't happen. And I think that ultimately, you know, aside from the fact that this could be changed, okay, the best news here is that we the people never voted for this guy. And I'll say something else. We the people did not elect this Senate, at least 10 members of which were put into office illegitimately. I mean, for too long, you know, pro progressives have felt besieged and outnumbered and hopeless. There's no way we can turn this around. How can we be so stupid? That's the European consensus. How can so many Americans be so dumb? Okay, let, let's, let's give the people some credit. The turnout is higher than we think. People care more than we think. People are smarter than we think. People will vote for their self-interest in ways you can rely on. So I guess I, I conclude by saying, you know, let's, let's talk about what's right with America for a change, okay? What's, what's probably most right about America is the system of Republican self-government. And if we want to salvage that system, I think we have to face the truth and act on it. Thank you.